There are deep issues between all of us in relation to our past treatment of each other based on immutable characteristics such as skin color and gender, especially as these relate to collective belief systems. I would like to preface the following video as it is a perspective from within the treacherous territory of race relations. The issues addressed in this video include many grave charges laid at the feet of people and institutions which are, for many of us, tied up in our identities. As such, it is possible that some may be disturbed by comments made in this video. A primary goal of starting this channel for me is to challenge myself to look at landscapes which require a great deal of courage. My posture in this conversation and moving into this space at all is attempting to be one of humility and agape, as the goal is to simply see this land through the eyes of those who are in it. As I state in the intro, to me, this landscape appears as if it were no man's land in World War I. The trenches, barbed wire, constant shelling, and poison gas. I'm hoping to learn from those who are in this territory and hopefully open space for deeper discussions, as I have yet to see a path through this territory presented by anyone in the current cultural conversation. With this in mind, I ask if negative reactions come up for you while watching, that you notice them. And remember, this is simply the sharing of territory from a perspective that I hope might be useful for all of us. It is not an effort to establish a historical narrative. Whatever your reactions are, I ask that you keep in mind and remember that at the end of the day, we're all part of the same thing. We're all in this together. We're all human beings, and all the things that we put up in between each other are ultimately illusions. So hello, and welcome back to Climbing on Mount Sophia. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by uh, Mark Charles. Um, Mark came to my attention via a, a friend who had spoken with him um, for some work he was doing on restorative justice in seminary, and I found... Um, some of the some of the points he brought up about Mark's work that are are very compelling, and so I had hoped to just get to meet you. And um, I'm very I'm very grateful that you're willing to come and and talk to me. Um, I call my channel "Climbing on Mount Sophia," which is kind of a gesture toward how I try to do conversations. Um, and so I kind of envision us as two. Um, two individuals coming together at the foot of a great mountain and looking at some some terrain that you have um, been exploring for some time now around restorative justice and racial issues and um, especially around the Native American and, and uh, colonial issues. And that, when I look at that landscape, it evokes for me something like a um, the Western Front of World War I. And I, I feel as if I'm looking out on no man's land and there is there are trees stripped naked and shell holes and uh, barbed wire with bodies um, filled with bullets in them. So I'm part of the reason I wanted to do this conversation is I'm terrified to do it. Um, and I, 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 I have not said much in this um, in anything about kind of racial tensions or or those histories, because I just didn't even know where to start. And I didn't want to um, be presumptuous or um, foolish in that. So I'm hoping that um, I can maybe uh, ask you to guide me a little bit and maybe ask some questions and, um, and go from there. So with all of that said, I, um, I don't generally do traditional introductions with that um, picture in mind of us approaching the mountain together. I ask for uh, my guests to kind of give us a sense of the landscape from which you come and maybe um, just some of the some of the tools you use in your thinking to approach um, conversations and difficult conversations. So um, welcome and uh, if you could tell us a little bit about um, about where you come from. Well, thank you, Ken. It's uh, it's good to be with you. I'm glad we can have this conversation. Um, I need to start first of all just by introducing myself traditionally. So, yat e, Mark Charles Yenishia, sin bekei dene nishle do tohiglini bashishin, 
Sinbakevner Dasha Cheder to the Chitni Dashanella. In our Navajo culture, when we introduce ourselves, we always give our four clans. We're matrilineal as a people, and our identities come from our mother's mother. My mother's mother is actually American of Dutch heritage, and that's why I say Sinbakevner. Loosely translated, what that means is I'm from the wooden shoe people. My second clan, my father's mother, is Tohiglini, which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Tsinbukedina. And then my fourth clan, my father's father, is Toruchitni, and that's the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans of our Navajo people. I also need to start just by acknowledging that I'm living in Washington, D.C. right now. I moved here with my family from, from the Navajo Nation about seven and a half, eight years ago. And the lands where I'm living now, that they today call Washington, D.C., these are the traditional lands of the Piscataway. And so I want to honor the Piscataway as the host people of the lands where I'm living. I want to thank the Piscataway for their stewardship of these lands. And I want to just state how humbled I am to be living on these lands today. And that introduction, as well as that land acknowledgement that I just did, that is how I try to approach all of these types of conversations, which is acknowledging and remembering who I am, who my ancestors are, who my parents are, who my family is, uh, what our story is. And then acknowledge the land and the people who have been stewarding the lands where not just that I come from, where I am today, and that there's a deeper history of these lands than what is reported in history books or written down in, uh, in, in the historical narrative of our country. And so I find by doing both of those things, by acknowledging my family and by acknowledging the land where I live, it helps me to approach these types of conversations with a greater sense of humility. Mm. Understanding that there's a lot of things that are here that are rarely, if ever, talked about. And therefore, we need to we need to uh, acknowledge and remember those things. And then by acknowledging even my own family, my mother, who is American of Dutch heritage, my father, who is Navajo, Diné, um, acknowledging the complex story and history of these lands. Um, and that causes me to, uh, actually not just causes me, it, it compels me to enter these conversations with a greater sense of humility. Mm. It almost sounds like there's a sense of, of grounding and connectedness that's really important in all of that as well. It really is. And it it's not just... It, when you look at these dialogues that we have in our country, the United States of America, um, especially the way that this country was founded on white supremacy and racism and the defining of race. And so much of that conversation deals with power differential or, you know, where does the power lie? Mm -hmm. And that is not probably the most accurate or healthy way to even approach these types of conversations. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Western culture, I agree. as well as Western religion, is absolutely obsessed with power. Power mm -hmm. can be defined as having the ability to act. So you have muscle mass, you have financial resources, you can muscle with your muscles, you can lift things up with your financial resources you can purchase things or pay to have things done for you um that's your power uh your ability to act authority is defined as the right of jurisdiction or mm -hmm. if you will the permission to act the integrity mm -hmm. to act so our country right they'll remind you weekly if not daily that they've created the most prosperous financial system in the history of the world that they have created the most powerful military in the history of the world, right? Our, there's not a day that Wall Street or politicians don't remind you of the power of this nation. But for power to be effective, it has to be demonstrated, 
right? Mm. You can't just brag about your power. You have to demonstrate your power. So why does most nations listen to the United States of America? Well, because we've demonstrated, not only we've not only have we said we have nuclear weapons, we've actually used them mm -hmm. to kill hundreds of thousands of civilians, mm -hmm. right, during World War II. And so most nations ob obey us or do our bidding because we've demonstrated we don't have any qualms about destroying massive populations to fill, meet our own agenda. Mm -hmm. The same thing with our money, right? We love to flaunt our money. We love to flaunt our resources. We, we, in order to use your power, it has to be demonstrated. Mm -hmm. Authority, it's much more inherent. You either have it or you don't, and you don't have to brag about it. Mm -hmm. And so while our nation talks frequently and demonstrates frequently its power, mm -hmm. it almost never talks about authority. Mm -hmm. It loves to focus on its ability to act, but it really never, it tries to avoid conversations around its permission or mm -hmm. its integrity to act. Why? Because by and large, we don't have any. This mm -hmm. nation does not have much authority. If we lost our nuclear arsenal, if we went bankrupt as a country, there's hardly a nation in the world that gives a crap what we have to say. Mm -hmm. right? We have very little authority, mm -hmm. but we have a ton of power. And so what, are... what I have to recognize as I enter in these conversations, especially as a Native man, is how do I how do I take my place in this conversation when I have very little power, mm. but as a native man, I have a much greater amount of authority. Mm. And so when I first started to wrestle with how do we have these conversations, I, I had moved with my family from Denver, Colorado, where I was pastoring a church, and right. I moved back to um, the reservation. And we moved to a very remote section of our reservation. We were living um, six miles off the nearest dirt road on a paved road. Um, the community we lived in had no running water, no electricity. Uh, our neighbors were uh, shepherds and rug weavers, Right. We lived in a one room Hogan, which is a traditional Navajo dwelling. It had log walls and a dirt floor. We had to haul our water and cook by an open fire or over a camp stove. Uh, we had to use an outhouse outside the, the Hogan. We had to keep warm by burning a fire. Right. We, we literally were living completely off the grid. And we prepared for that. We prepared to live off the grid. But once we moved there, the thing we found that was the most shocking and actually the most difficult was how marginalized we were. Mm. One of our first observations was um, how we rarely, if ever, saw anyone who was not Native. Mm -hmm. Non-Natives primarily go to reservations for one of two reasons. They go there to give charity or mm. they go there to take pictures. Mm. Almost no one who's not Native goes to the reservation for the sake of building real authentic relationship. Mm -hmm. And again, it, it felt like we had dropped off the face of the earth. It literally felt like, mm. you know, because we, we were seeing no, <laughs> we were, it's like lost all communication. And as we lived there, I began to learn about our nation's oppressive history with um, with Native peoples. I began to see the historical trauma and its impact on my own native peoples. I saw the broken families. I saw the addiction issues. I saw all the things that were that were plaguing our, our, our Navajo nation. And as I began to see that more clearly and understand the history better, I found myself actually becoming very angry mm -hmm. and feeling a complete loss of power. Right. I had no idea how do I engage this conversation? How do I change the circumstances? What do I how do I affect change in the midst of this when I have almost no power? Mm -hmm. And I was wrestling through that with some of my friends, trying to talk about these things, even trying to explore what I was feeling myself. Because mm -hmm. I had never felt these emotions before. I was feeling shame. I was feeling being overwhelmed. I was feeling this loss of hope. And I found every time I tried to talk about it, I could actually sense the anger welling up in me. 
mm. until I had to either drop out of the conversation or hang up the phone so I wouldn't literally start yelling at my friends. Sure. And so I, I, to keep myself engaged, I began to talk about these things like I read them in the newspaper, in the mm -hmm. third person. Mm -hmm. I found by doing that, I could stay in the conversation longer mm -hmm. without getting emotionally overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. But then I observed that the longer I stayed in the conversation, the more my friends began to wrestle with things and they began sure. to feel ashamed. They began to get agitated. They began to, to back out of the conversation. And I didn't know how to have this conversation without either dropping myself out or dropping my friends out. How, I didn't know how to have this conversation. And one day I was writing a letter. This was maybe the 10th time I was trying to get my friends to understand how it felt to be native living on a reservation in the middle of this country. And in my letter, I said to them, I said, it feels like our native communities are this old grandmother mm. who has a very large and a very beautiful house. And mm. years ago, some people came into our house and they locked us upstairs in the bedroom. Mm. Today, our house is full of people. They're sitting on our furniture. They're eating our food. They're having a party inside our house. Now they've since come upstairs and they've unlocked the door to our bedroom, but it's much later. We're tired, we're old, we're weak, we're sick, so we can't or we don't come out. But the thing that hurts the most, the thing that causes the most pain is that virtually nobody from this party ever comes upstairs, mm -hmm. sticks out the grandmother in the bedroom, sits down next to her on the bed, takes her hand and simply says, thank you. Mm -hmm. I wrote that and immediately I'm like, that's it. That's that's how I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. And I began to share that with people in my community. And there was one gentleman who had lived on the reservation most of his life. And he said, you know, Mark, I've struggled all my life to articulate how it feels to live here. And you're hitting the nail on the head. Mm. I began to share that with my non-native friends. And instead of getting agitated, agitated and dropping out of the conversation, they would come back and say, how do we say thank you? Mm. How does my family, my community, my church, my city, my nation express gratitude to the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island. Mm. Well, see, now we're having a completely different conversation. Mm -hmm. Now, instead of talking about victim versus oppressor, now we're talking about what I think is actually the root of the problem, which is we have this reversal of roles. Mm. This nation is comprised of 300 million plus mm -hmm. undocumented immigrants, most of them from Europe. They've never asked for, nor have they ever been given permission to be here. And they're running around like they own the place. Meanwhile, we have 6 million indigenous peoples who have been pushed aside to reservations and the margins of society. And we're being treated like unwanted guests in someone else's house. Mm. If we wanna move forward positively, we have to reverse those roles. I need these, undocumented immigrants, especially the European ones, to realize, to recognize that in some very real and practical ways, they are guests in someone else's house, uninvited mm. guests in someone else's house. And I want our native community to understand in some very real and practical ways that we are the host people of the land and we have to step into our role of the host. And the difference is it's not power, mm -hmm. right? White people have a ton of power. The native community has something that white people can't steal, they can't buy, they can't take away. And that's mm. authority, it's agency. It's 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 the right to be here. And this is where I think we see so many of the problems we have as a nation is that white America is trying desperately to legitimize itself here. Mm. But it has no way to do that because the entire its entire history in this land has been colonial, ethnic cleansing, and genocidal. Mm. And so there's no healthy relationship to go back to to say, yeah, when we came in, we signed treaties and we kept those treaties and we we fulfilled our commitments and we you know we know that that doesn't never happened 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so this nation has no authority. Mm. And by and large, it knows that. It's well aware of that, which is why it absolutely focuses on its power and attempts to use its power to legitimize itself and to do something that can only come with authority. Mm. Wow, that's a lot. That is a lot. Um, thank you for sharing that, first of all. Um, that's uh, I can't really imagine what that feels like to go through very well. Um, and um, for what it's worth, I will say thank you. Um, although I'm not sure that that's, um, I don't know if I can properly do that. What I would like to do is kind of reflect back to you some of the some of the thoughts and feelings I had while you were saying that. Um, one of them, when you were talking about authority and power, um, what was coming up for me was the notion of the distinction between prestige and dominance, and that that a prestige hierarchy functions based on um, a kind of legitimacy of of connectedness and acknowledgement of the other and um, and um, reciprocity and those kinds of things and which which is dis- distinct in humans as compared to primates and 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 other um other animals versus the dominance hierarchy which is just kind of pure power and one of the things in that is this um the, the, this notion of connectedness like this, the feeling of of connectedness versus disconnection. Like there's almost this way in which, as you're talking about, like the kind of arbitrary use of power almost and display of power as like it it, it requires a, a belief that we are somehow disconnected from each other, that, that I can actually be over here and put impact over here and it doesn't feed back. And, and that's something that I, I, I do feel like one of the things that has always bothered me in in terms of my heritage is like there's not a lot of like there's not a lot of tradition right there's there's some traditional things but it's kind of a mis- mishmash of things but like it, it's not like you feel connected like i've been to europe and you go there and it's like oh man there's something there's something it means to be a citizen of this place whereas um and it, and that's distinct in some ways um from from how i felt in my upbringing and so Maybe one of the things I'm hearing is like there's this there's this sense of the dichotomy of connection versus disconnection and the sense of being able to kind of just arbitrarily express your will on the world um, versus even just how you introduce yourself with this deep kind of groundedness, this deep connectedness to your family, to all others, to the ground that you live on. Um, and that, and that what's really missing, like one of the big keys that's missing in the, in that juxtaposition that holds people in the power stance is this lack of gratitude. And that, and that maybe even gratitude is like the key to starting to unlock that, that issue. Yeah. Yeah. And that I, I've been talking about this a lot, uh, especially in the past few weeks, as we've just passed, we're coming up on the end of November, we've gone through not only Native American Heritage Month, but we've gone through Thanksgiving. Um, and uh, in, in the book that I, I wrote, I co-authored, and that was published in 2019 called Unsettling Truth. And this book is about the ongoing dehumanizing legacy of the doctrine of discovery and how this doctrine of discovery has been used by both the church and the nation to attempt to legitimize itself here on turtle island Mm. and it's done that through the exercise of power the enslavement of african people and the the ethnic ethnic cleansing and genocide of native peoples and it justifies all of these things even based on the biblical narrative of how the the jews um uh, gained access to their promised land in mm-hmm. in Canaan. And uh, the book is very unsettling. It's, it's aptly named. Um, it demonstrates how this dehumanizing doctrine of discovery that says things like invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever, reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, convert them to his and to their use and profit, right? How this doctrine, 
which basically is the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever lands you find not ruled by white European rulers, those people are subhuman and their lands are yours to take. So that doctrine gets embedded into the foundations of the country. The Declaration of Independence refers to natives as merciless Indian savages. Right after it said all men are created equal. The Constitution, which starts with we the people. A few lines later, Article 1, Section 2, it never mentions women, specifically excludes natives, counts Africans as three-fifths of a person. Right? I mean, when you read our founding documents, they are absolutely racist, sexist, and white supremacist. I mean, that's what's written into our foundations. They're a part of, of who this nation identified itself with from the very, very beginning. And that doctrine of discovery goes on to become literally by the Supreme Court, first in 1823 and then later, the doctrine of discovery becomes the legal precedent for land titles. Mm -hmm. Not treaties, but this dehumanizing doctrine of discovery becomes and is used to this day as the legal precedent for land titles. And so the, the book, right, it lays out this history. It talks about how all these things were justified. It, it even shows a very clear, historically accurate picture of Abraham Lincoln, mm -hmm. who was, in all honesty, one of the most blatant, unapologetic, self-proclaimed white supremacists our nation has ever seen as well as probably one of the most genocidal presidents our nation's ever had. Mm. He stated these things over and over and over again. And so the, the book is very unsettling, but the intro into the book, in the introduction, I share a story very intentionally about a discipline that I picked up when I, actually I didn't pick it up, I, I intentionally wove it into my life when I moved back to the reservation which is for hundreds of years, my people have woken up in the morning, walked or run towards the east and greeted the sunrise with our prayers. Hmm. And when I moved back to the Navajo Nation, I took up that discipline and I woke up every morning and I greeted the sunrise with my prayers. Now, if you see a sunrise once or twice a year, maybe on an Easter service or when you have an early flight, right? If the clouds are just right and, and you catch it at the right moment, it's breathtaking. It causes you to stop and pause. But after waking up to watch the sunrise day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and eventually decade after decade, I began to recognize that something much deeper was going on in me. As I watch the seasons come and go, as I watch the flowers and the grass and the plant grow and bloom and flower and die and leaves fall, as I watch the, the animals and the birds migrate in the general direction of the sun, as I saw the seasons change, uh, winter and spring and summer and fall, as I watch this happen again, year after year, over and over and over again, at a very deep level in my soul, I began to recognize that I'm not in control. So everything about Western culture is about being in control. This is why weather freaks out Americans so much, because it's the one, it's one of the few things they can't control, and nor can they even properly insure themselves from it, you know, like, so they're terrified of weather. Um, And so but everything about Western culture is about how do you either get control or maintain the illusion of control, even mm -hmm. down to how Western culture perceives time, which is linear, as mm -hmm. compared to how most indigenous cultures perceive time, which is circular. Mm -hmm. In a linear perception of time, you keep a schedule and you honor and value people based on the schedule. And that schedule gives you the perception that you're in control. <laughs> indigenous cultures we see time circularly circularly and we don't we don't gauge it by keeping a schedule we gauge it by completing a task yeah and while linear time may be much more efficient circular time leads to a much better product if you're trying to do something 
even better relationships because mm -hmm. it uh it allows you to complete the task mm -hmm. and but it ha you have to embrace this fact that you're not in control mm -hmm. right you, you're just you're going around and, and the same thing with watching the sunrise watching the sunrise day after day week after week month after month year after year what it taught me was i was not in control and I actually found comfort in that, right? Whether I was awake or not, whether it was cloudy or not, whether I was there or not, the sun was still going to rise. Mm -hmm. I couldn't speed it up. I couldn't slow it down. I couldn't make the seasons change their orders. I was not in control. But if I was there and present and observing it and witnessing it, it was an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. One I would never want to miss. And so it taught me at a very deep level, a very deep level that I wasn't in control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And along with that understanding came a much deeper sense of gratitude. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've experienced this. I've, 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 I very much resonate with this. And I think, oh man, so, oh, gosh. So I want to, I want to jump with, take that and run with it a little bit, because this is part of how um, some of your ideas have struck me, especially your articulation of this whole issue, whatever, you know, however we want to refer to it as being a lot of individuals on different sides caught up in a traumatic experience. And that, and that the perpetrators of trauma and the victims of trauma are both, you know, moving through trauma or having trauma move through them. And there's, you know, there's this idea that I think is a very, um, a very deep one, at least it, it seems to be from my per perception existentially that people don't have ideas, ideas have people. And that in some sense that the ideas we pay attention to will run through us and, and move us in directions that we don't even understand and we don't want to, um, necessarily, we don't will to happen. And so, um, you know, I think I think there's something really, really dangerous and unhelpful about perceiving ourselves as being in control. And I think actually that's um, part of the fundamental notion of original sin, as as laid out in in the old biblical stories that that it's the it's the flip toward the attempt to control what is real, instead of experience what what is and us and assign reality to what to what is experienced versus and a projection of what is real onto the world. Um, and so I wanted to ask about like one of the things that I wonder about and, and I don't, um, I don't know with, with, within these whole conversations is I think, I think your the way you articulate the doctrine of discovery and that, betrayal of what it means to be the church right like you go through this in the two talks that i listened um to of yours one was the spiritual price of the doctrine of discovery and the other was race trauma and the doctrine of discovery and i'll, I'll link to those in the description of this video um but in both of those you talk about how this is directly antithetical to christ to the message of christ that, that you know the, the message of christ is diametrically opposed to this kind of posture and I, you know, when I look at, you know, say, at, at least what we know of, of history, it, it seems like, and correct me if I'm, I'm asking this as a question, I want to pose this as a question, but that the notion that it, it is inappropriate to, to, to live in a might makes right kind of world and to just take what, what you can and, and conquer by, um, by whatever means necessary that that is kind of a novel idea that that's actually the wrong way to go about doing things at the time of Christ. And if, if, if that is the case, then we have this thing where the church, which follows from Christ kind of turns over on itself with this, with the move to prostitution to the empire, I think, as you, as you called it, which I would very much agree with. Um, and, And so I, I'm trying to, I guess what I'm trying to get to is I don't like how much of this needs to be nested within this framework of acknowledging or 
or talking about that, hey, the frame that we start with, now we, we all take it as ubiquitous now that you should definitely not do genocide. You should definitely not go and just take people's lands and kill them for it. But for most of human history, we didn't do that. We were we were horrible to each other. So do you feel like there's a need to kind of nest this conversation within that kind of framing? Or how does that how does that land for you? Um, I mean, there's a lot of things you brought up in in that that I, I could go back and respond to. Um, I think, yeah, let, let's start with the role the Christian faith plays in this doctrine so whether it's in the talk that you you talked about which was the spiritual price of the doctrine discovery or we lay it all out in chapters three and four of unsettling truths as well we look at how the church got from the teachings of jesus who said things like love your neighbor or love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you right how we got from that to a church that said you can kill people who don't look like, speak like, worship like, or act like you. And I didn't start out to write that. But as I be as we begin to write down the write out the book, my co-author Sung Chan Ra and I, um I I actually followed a rabbit trail that I got on when I wanted to include the story of Constantine's vision at Melvane Bridge where he claimed that he saw an image of a cross and was told by Christ that he should conquer under this cross. Um, and all my life, I've blamed the heresy of Christendom, Christian empire on Constantine. But as I went back and read where that vision was recorded, which was in the writings of Eusebius, um, I began to, and I, so as I dug deeper into Eusebius's writings, I recognized that the heresy of Christian empire seemed much more to origi originate with Eusebius, and then he fed that to Constantine. Constantine's the one who converted the, the Roman Empire to Christianity, but the heresy began with Eusebius. Mm -hmm. And so I, the, 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 the vision was recorded in his book, The Life of the Blessed Constantine. But his earlier writing, his earlier book, which was titled um, Ecclesiastical History, right? The History of the Church. It's actually a volume of 11 books. And he attempted, he was attempting to write down the history of the church. It had never been done. This is the fourth century. It had never been done before. And so he started actually with, um, with the story even before Christ was born. And then he 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 kind of glossed over the life of Christ and picked it up with the apostles. And, you know, it, they, well, anyway, I won't go through all of his writings. But when you look at, let's go back to Jesus. When you look at Jesus's writings, are Jesus, the, the recordings about Jesus in the Gospels. Jesus was coming into the nation of Israel, and the nation of Israel prior to Christ, they related to God primarily through what was known as their land covenant, right? This covenant that said if they obeyed God, God would bless them and they would prosper in their lands. If they disobeyed God, God would curse them and they would be exiled from their lands. So their prosperity was one of their barometers of their relationship with God, right? They could they could gauge how well they were doing with with God, in general, based on how well they were prospering, were their borders strong, were their crops growing, were they well fed, were their children healthy? Yeah, they were probably doing well with God. Were their borders porous? Were they in exile? Were they, you know, hungry or in, even starving? There's a good chance something was wrong in their relationship with God. Their, their prosperity was not their only barometer, but it was one of their major barometers. And then Jesus comes in, right, and he's the Messiah. But right away, he's different. You know, he, he's the Messiah. He's he's the he's the Son of God. He's, um, you know, fulfilling all these prophecies. But he's born in a barn, and raised up as a refugee. Right? He's not living this life of this great Messiah figure that we think we 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 see in the Old Testament. Um, you know, angels announce his coming, but they're singing to shepherds. 
And early on in his ministry, he's tempted both by Satan and the people to create an earthly kingdom, right? The people of Israel were waiting for God to send the Messiah to basically rebuild the greatness of the kingdom of David, which is where kind of their golden age, if, if you will. And they wanted to go back because under the Romans, they were not prospering, right? They couldn't move freely. They're being taxed. They had census being taken. They, they couldn't be their own, their, their own nation. And so Jesus, Jesus definitely it states he came and to fulfill the role of the Messiah, but he wasn't, didn't come the way they expected him to come. And then in his mm -hmm. teaching, he turns the barometer around, right? He says, blessed are you, not when you are prospering, mm -hmm. but blessed are you when you're persecuted. Mm -hmm. Because that's how they treated the prophets of old. So he's changing their barometer. Mm -hmm. The people of Israel knew they were doing well with God when they prospered. Jesus told his disciples, you'll know you're doing well in your discipleship with me when you're persecuted mm -hmm. now the disciples hated that message right <laughs> right away peter's like no we're not you don't have to suffer you don't have to die right jesus calls peter satan rebukes him and the whole if you look at in the gospel of mark the whole second half of the book of mark is jesus trying to shove it into his disciples heads that he is going to suffer and they mm -hmm. are supposed to be suffering too Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they don't get it, right? They die. They uh, Jesus dies alone. They all left him. They're like, we mm -hmm. don't want any part of this. And it's not until Pentecost that they finally clue in. And as a result, they actually all go on, most of them go on to die a martyr's death. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when Eusebius is recording ecclesiastical history, he actually holds up the martyrs in high esteem. Because these are pious men and women who are sharing in the suffering of Christ. Mm -hmm. Between books eight and nine, in his account of ecclesiastical history, he inserts a book. And the book is called um, uh, uh, The Book of the Martyrs. Mm. And it's about the great persecution that happened in the early fourth century. Eusebius records that the great persecution happened in his own backyard, mm. in Palestine. Mm. And that he saw many of the people martyred with his own eyes. Mm. And he knew many of the martyrs personally. Mm. So it touched him. The mm. persecution touched him. And then after the Book of the Martyrs, his whole attitude towards martyrdom begins to change. And instead of holding up the martyrs in high esteem, he begins to explore how they might end the persecution. And mm -hmm. the plan he lands on is to prop up Constantine as the ordained an emperor ordained by God right and so he he literally is like okay now that that got way too close let's figure out how to end the persecution mm -hmm. and this is where he starts propping up Constantine as the God ordained emperor of Rome mm -hmm. now if you want to establish an earthly kingdom, an earthly Christian kingdom. But Jesus was adamant was not going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. He walked away when the people tried to make him king. He walked away when when um, Satan tempted him and said if he would bow down to him, he would give him the kingdoms of the earth. Jesus is like, no, my kingdom is somewhere else. My kingdom is not of this earth. It's somewhere else. He even died telling Pilate the exact same thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and so, uh, if you want to establish the heresy known as a Christian empire, a Christendom, mm. your biggest obstacle is Jesus. Mm. And so when you look at when you look at all 11 books in, in the volume of, of uh, ecclesiastical history is written by Eusebius, you would assume if you're writing a book called The History of the Church, your book would not have a conclusion. Because the history of the church won't end until the mm -hmm. bridegroom of the church returns. And so the fact that you're writing the book, it's evidence it mm -hmm. hasn't happened yet. And so you're at best writing a pre, you're, you're writing, you're writing the beginning of this long saga, right? You're not, mm -hmm. you're not, there's no conclusion. But if you read to the last book 
And the last chapter of this ecclesiastical history is recorded by Eusebius. You will find he absolutely does have a conclusion. Hmm. His conclusion is the salvation that comes to Rome, not through Christ, but through Constantine. Hmm. He actually literally sets up Constantine as the God-ordained, not only emperor, but savior of Rome. And then his next book, The Life of the Blessed Constantine, is just flat out heresy. Mm. So if you want, right, if you want to have Christian empire, you have to write Christ out of ecclesiastical history, which is exactly what Eusebius does. Mm -hmm. And so the Old Testament Israel had a barometer of prosperity. Christ gave his followers a barometer of suffering. And Christendom was born when Eusebius decided to reject this barometer of suffering and said, let's go back to this barometer of prosperity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the problem is now you have this Christian empire mm -hmm. and an empire has to perpetuate itself, right? So Christ told his followers that you need to lose your life, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, You need to lay down your life, pick up your cross, and follow me. An empire can't do that. An well, empire is required. The definition of empire necessitates that you preserve it. Mm -hmm. And so now that you have a Christian empire, a Christian empire cannot lay down its life. It cannot empty itself. It has mm -hmm. to continue to strengthen and to conquer and to grow. Mm -hmm. so would it be it, what like so thank you thank you i appreciate that would it be then the case that like what we need is a reversion to a to a proper understanding of what it means to be christian as as that was the thing that actually provided us the ground on which to say like love your enemies that that what we're because one i guess and another thing no, let's let let me stop with that question because, yeah. So, like, I'm do we need the grounding of do we need the grounding of Christ to move through this thing? Because what I often see in at least the cultural dialogue that I that I I, I perceive around all these issues with with attempts at racial reconciliation is all about power and transference of power and who gets the power. And, and that to me sounds like, okay, we're just trying to shuffle the empire around. And it's like, well, if, if we're going to all come together and recognize that, like you, like you said, in some of these talks, like race is a construct, like there's not actually something different about us, except for what we set up between ourselves arbitrarily. So, and then there's a lot of th ways we can go with this, and we could easily go on for hours of what's this whole conversation. But yeah, we may have I to do another say, one. I know we're running out of time. What I would say is, um, if you if you look at okay, my family story, and this is the story for most indigenous peoples around the world is we were colonized by the gospel, mm. right? Because of the heresy of Christendom, Christian mm -hmm. empire, which created the doctrine of discovery, the church has been in bed with empire for 1,600 years. Mm. And it's far more colonial than Christ-like. Mm. And so it's it's been in bed with empire for 1,600 years, and it's at almost down to nearly down to its essence, it's colonial. Mm. And so as the church was going out and colonizing the world, they were also converting the indigenous peoples and the people of these lands into civilizing them into Christians, right? And so the legacy of that, one of the legacies of that in the United States of America and all places around the world is the boarding schools, the residential schools, mm. which were set up and established as a, a way to forcibly assimilate Native peoples into Western colonial culture. And so my grandparents were both boarding school survivors. Mm. 
my grandmother converted to the Christian faith in the boarding school. Mm. And her family converted as well. But the faith that they converted to didn't just say, here is this person of Jesus who now reconciles you back to creator. Mm -hmm. As you know, creator through our own creation stories. But the, 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 the gospel that they were forced to embrace said, no, there's this create, there's this other creation story in the book of Genesis. And that's mm -hmm. the true creation story. And then there's this whole narrative of Jesus, of, of, of God's chosen people. And then there's the birth of Jesus. And now there's this Western Christianity. And so Jesus really only loves you if you're white. And you have to, because Jesus was made white by Western Christianity. And you have to speak English and you have to give up your ceremonies and embrace the Easter bunny and Santa Claus. And right, you need to become American or western a ton of layers of cultural and bullshit and that's the faith my grandparents were given mm -hmm. and so they didn't pass the language on to my father or my aunt they didn't pass the culture on to them and so my father didn't know it to pass it on to me mm -hmm. and when i was a young adult in my in my 20s i began to meet with a group of people it was called a, it was a an association called the world christian gathering on indigenous peoples. And it was literally indigenous Christians from all over the world who were gathering every one or two years to encourage and share stories and to um, build each other up in the process that they were all on of decolonizing their faith. Mm. Asking what does it mean to be a member of my indigenous nation, whether it's Maori or, or uh, Dakota or Navajo or Sami, what does it mean to be a member of my nation and still follow Jesus? Mm -hmm. And so as I started meeting with those people and building relationships there, I began my own journey of decolonizing my faith. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so one of the one of the things I point out is most indigenous peoples, no matter what part of the world they live in, has the experience of being colonized by the gospel. Mm -hmm which is colonizers came in and they didn't just come in and colonize, but they came in and brought the gospel and said, here's the story. You have to convert to it and you have to give up your culture and become Western like us. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the experience of so many people. And so in, in this book, one of the stories we share is the story about the Kikuyu people. Now the Kikuyu, they are in what's now modern day Kenya. Mm. And, um, I share the story as told to me by a friend of mine from that nation, um, now working and living in Canada. And it was his great, 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 great grandfather, a, a very early ancestor of his, um, who was a part of that nation when the first missionary came in. And he was actually sent off to school. He got educated in English and, and he came back to the village. And by that time, other members of the tribe had converted and they were in the process of, of translating the Bible into the Kikuyu language. Mm -hmm. And they came across the first instance of the word God. And the Kikuyu wanted to use the word Nagai, which is their word for God, creator. Mm -hmm. And the missionary was saying, no, no, you have to use the word God in here because we don't want to corrupt these scriptures with your pagan view of God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And my friend's ancestor said to the missionary, he said, sir, we've known creator for millennia, for generations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We didn't know creator had a son. If you make us use your word for God in this translation, this book will merely be about the white man's God. Mm -hmm. But if we use our word in the guy... This translation, this book, will be an extension of the general revelation we've already received, mm -hmm. helping us understand how to be reconciled back to Creator through the blood of Christ. And so, in the 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 missionary conceded, and they used the word Nagai in their translation instead of the word God, mm -hmm. and. 
right? This this has enormous ramifications theologically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually in the process of writing another book right now. And the title of the book that I'm working on, the working title I have, is um, Decolonizing Faith. Mm. And it's looking at my own journey and some of these very difficult understandings of what does it mean to be, for me, Navajo, mm. as well as be a follower, be reconciled to creator through the blood of mm. Christ. Mm. Like, what does that mean? How does that play out? What does it look like? And one of the things I'm looking at is how have the scriptures been weaponized mm. to oppress people of color and women throughout the history of the church? Mm. And so one, one, I've actually, I've been preaching a sermon for the past year and a half. And it's, I title it Radical Inclusivity. Mm. And in this sermon, I look closely at the, the story with Peter and Cornelius in Acts 10. Mm -hmm. And because in Acts 10, something happens that has never happened before in the New Testament, which is you have an uncircumcised Gentile in Cornelius being baptized into the church. And I got to that passage because I was challenged at one point to look closely at the story of the Canaanite woman in mm -hmm. the Gospels, right? This woman from Canaan, or the Seraphonician woman, she's called in other, in other Gospels, who comes to Jesus and wants her daughter healed, who she's possessed by a demon. And the disciples try to send her away. She finally gets through to Jesus. He says, I'm here for the Jews, right? This woman's a Gentile. And... And she is insistent and says, well, please heal my daughter. And finally, he looks at her and says, why would I give to the dogs what was meant for the children? Mm -hmm. But the woman is not to be deterred. And so she snaps back and says, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall off the table. Now, I had been in the church long enough. I've heard enough sermons, even preached some sermons that made Jesus look good in that passage. Right? Right. That made mm. Jesus come out of that passage looking good, even though he calls her a dog. Mm. And that day when I was looking at it, I decided, what if I let this passage say what it actually appears to be saying, which is Jesus held the ethnocentric views of his time. Mm. Which is that Jews were in the middle, they were in the center, everyone else was on the periphery. Mm. If you if you allow it to say that, which is what that passage appears to say, yeah, that passage makes a whole lot more sense. Mm. But now you have a huge theological question, which is, well, what's Jesus doing then? Is he sinning? What what's going on here? And that led me to look further at Jesus, the rest of Jesus' interactions in the Gospels with Gentiles, mm. and he only has a few. Mm -hmm. He has the Seraphonician woman. He has the centurion who he never goes into his house. Mm -hmm. And he has the demoniac who, even though he heals him, but the guy begs Jesus to let him follow him. And Jesus says, no. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is only interaction with Gentiles. He actually does what you would expect any first century rabbi to do, which is he keeps them at arm's length. What would you say about the Samaritan woman? Samaritan woman, you have to deal with her because she's are Jewish. Mm -hmm. okay. Gentiles, you can completely write off. Mm -hmm. Right? And he does. He goes back to the village with the Samaritan woman. Mm -hmm. But he does not go any further with the Seraphonician woman, the centurion, or the demoniac. Yeah. He makes it quite clear that his, his mission is with the Jews. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, and what I recognized, right, is the church actually has what I would call a written theology about Jesus and a lived theology. Mm. The written theology states, and this is most churches confess that every time they take communion, which is reconciliation with God takes place at the death and resurrection. It happens mm. at the cross, right? This is what most churches confess. 
this is what most churches believe. If you ask a Christian, at what point does our is God reconciled, our our humans reconciled back to God? Most people would say it happens at the cross. However, we teach the life of Jesus like that reconciliation happened at the birth. Mm. And so we actually teach that Jesus loved and accepted everybody, mm. even though he didn't. Mm. He called the Seraphonician woman a dog, right? He did not let the, the, the um, demoniac follow him. The guy was begging Jesus, let me follow you. And Jesus mm. said, no, go back to your own people. And so there's this, right, there's these ways that we don't even teach the Gospels accurately. And so if you wanted to, and that, please link to my sermon, I'll send you the link and put it in the mm -hmm. notes because people can watch it. I don't have time to go through the whole sermon right now. But if, if you want to create the heresy, right, that says Jesus loved and accepted everybody, which he didn't, right? Mm -hmm. But if you want to create that heresy... You have to do one of two things, especially if you're in the outside group, mm. which Western Christianity is just as much of a Gentile as I am, right? White yeah, people yeah. are just as much Gentiles as I am a native, as a native man as I am. So what they did, because if you want to have the heresy, if you're not a Gentile, if you're not a Jew, that Jesus accepted you, you either have to become a Jew mm. or you have to make Jesus look like you. So Western Christianity made Jesus white. Mm -hmm. So what does this do? This allows Western Christianity to now treat the rest of us the same way Jesus treated Gentiles. And yet now they can claim that they're loving us because that's what Jesus did. Mm -hmm. We don't have to go into your house. We don't have to allow you into the inner circle. We can absolutely make sure you understand this is a tiered system and you are at the outer ring of the tiers. Mm. But we still love you because that's what Jesus did. Mm -hmm. See, if we don't recognize that Jesus was actually living under the law for his entire ministry and the law required him to keep separate from the Gentiles. He didn't come to keep the moral code of 2022 perfectly. He came to keep the Old Testament law perfectly. And the law required him to be separate from the Gentiles. And so that's why he held him at arm's length. Mm. Mm. In Interesting. Acts 10, right, the spirit appears, appears to Cornelius and says, call Peter. Peter's up on a, on a rooftop. He falls into a trance. While he's in this trance, he sees a vision of this blanket being let down, and there's all these animals, unclean animals on the blanket, and he's told to kill and eat. Now, Peter was with Jesus in Mark 7 when Jesus declared all foods clean. He was there, hmm. right? But in Acts 10, he definitively says, never, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. Okay. We might have said that stuff because we never read it. And that's true. Read the Gospels. There is no story of Jesus eating unclean food with Gentiles. Never happened. So then he's intrigued by this. He sees it three times. He's intrigued enough to go back with Cornelius's people. He walks in to Cornelius's house and he doesn't say, oh, that's right. I remember Jesus did this with the centurion. So I know everything's going to be okay. Instead, he walks in and he says, I'm not supposed to be here. You're a Gentile. I'm a Jew. I'm not supposed to be here. Uh -huh. But the spirit showed me to come. So tell me why I'm here. Cornelius tells him the story. Peter decides to preach to them. As he's preaching, he sees the same spirit that fell on the Jews in Acts 2. Because the Acts 2 community was only Jews. Mm -hmm. They're from all over the world, but they were all proselytes. They're all Jewish. Mm -hmm. All the men were circumcised. Everyone kept kosher. Everyone followed the laws of the synagogue. They all worshipped in Hebrew. It was not this great diversity we make it out to be. They were all proselytes. And so when he sees 
uncircumcised Gentiles in Cornelius's family receive the same spirit that they received in Acts 2. Mm -hmm. He says, there's nothing to prevent me from baptizing these people. Mm -hmm. Which is like a radical shift, right? Like this is absolutely First this is an time. this is an entirely new thing. Like we don't get this anywhere else in the world, do we? Like where else? Because because this and this is exactly like this is my concern with some of these things. Is like if we're going to push a at the equality and diversity thing, that has to be anchored in something, right? So so this is why. So I preached this sermon, right? So. Well, right after that, the, the circumcised believers who are with Peter are like, wow, they were astounded that even the Gentiles were in included. They had no clue. Yeah. This and Jesus. It's like inventing the wheel. He never modeled that. Again, he was entirely about the Jewish people. Yeah. It's bigger and than so inventing the wheel, actually. In the sermon, the question I'm addressing in the sermon is why has it been 16 2000 years since the birth and death of Christ and not only does the world not know how to acknowledge the humanity of everybody but the church refuses to acknowledge the humanity of everybody mm. and the answer is is because we're following the wrong model mm. we're following the model of Jesus in his ministry which was pre-reconciliation. Mm. Instead mm. of following the model of Acts 10, which was post-reconciliation. Mm. And Jesus, again, right, when he comforts his disciples, he's like, hey, I'm going to die, I'm going to go away. That's better for you because then I can send you my spirit who will dwell within you remind you of all my teachings and enable you to do even greater things than I've done. And we act like that's hyperbole. Mm. But what yeah. Peter does in Acts 10 is something Jesus never did in his entire ministry, which is he welcomed an uncircumcised Gentile into full communion. Mm. I'd have to, I'd have to do a little bit more thinking and reading and, and things about, about the ministry of Jesus before I would, I would for sure agree with you on that part, but I think it's a, I think it's a well taken point overall that, you know, that when we, like, one of the ways that I think of Christianity as such, and and Christian, it's such a hard word, right? It's such a hard concept, Christianity or the church, because there's like, gosh, it means so many different things in so many different contexts, and it's all over the place. Like you have Joel Osteen, and then you have, you know, like you know, the great saints of the past, you have St. Francis of Assisi, and it's like, the, okay, those are not the same thing. But that to, all that to say, I guess, for me, that, that, that thing, like that move there of pulling apart and, and making clear this, that at the center of the, the Christian notion, or the Christ, um, notion is that there's room for all and in fact it is it is a a a giving of being to all as they are such that they can become what they could be that is the central notion it's not a a an imposition of a particular way of being it's a giving of of the ground of being to to um to all those who have you know, held themselves back from what they could be by their own, by their own um, pride. And so, um, yeah, I guess um, I know we're nearly out of time. I, there's, there's several other things I wanted to, to, to get to. Maybe we'll do this another time, but um, thank you so much for coming. You're welcome. I mean, let me just, I'll, let me just kind of bring that to somewhat of a close. Sure. Which is, you know, you, it's, you ask the question, why does the church not reflect the teachings of Jesus? Why does the church not reflect even the heart of God? And it's because the church has basically rejected 
the two things that could be really, really transformative. Mm. Which is, first of all, they rejected Jesus as their savior. Mm. Right? That's what happened with Eusebius. He wrote Christ out of ecclesiastical history and inserted Constantine. Constantine mm. is the savior of Rome, not Christ. So in the you sense of, of shifting, shifting what it meant. You want Christian empire, you have to get rid of Christ, hmm. which is what the church did. So now it has Constantine. All right. In our I would say in our case, we have Abraham Lincoln, which is just as bad. So A, you have to do that. But then B, when you look at in Acts 10, what ushers in this incredible diversity, this radical inclusivity, mm. is the Holy Spirit. Using the blood of Christ, right? Is it, the reconciliation happened because Christ died. Mm. Now the Holy Spirit is calling for this radical inclusivity of even baptizing uncircumcised Gentiles, which was absolutely unheard of at that point. And, and so <laughs> the church, how can I say this succinctly? Going back to when Jesus is comforting his disciples, mm. right? He doesn't say, don't worry, in a couple of decades, you're going to intercept some letters not written to you, and you're going to have a committee meeting, of several committee meetings, and set these books aside as sacred and the unadulterated word of God. And then, you know, in, in a few centuries, you're going to have this incredible book that's going to give you right the the complete perfect divine revelation mm. of my will jesus doesn't come to his disciples that way mm -hmm. he says i'm going to go away and i'm going to send you my holy spirit and my holy spirit's going to dwell in you it's going to remind you what i taught it's going to empower you to do things even I've never done, mm. right? Jesus has the same amount of faith in the Holy Spirit that Western Christianity has in the Bible. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it's the Bible and the belief that the Bible is this unadulterated word of God. That's what's been weaponized. Mm. That's what's been used to oppress people. That's what's been used to justify things like enslavement and the oppression of women and ethnic cleansing of native peoples, right? As we have this book and we can close our eyes and point to a chapter and that's God's revelation to me, right? We have this, we have this book and Jesus never promised his followers a book. He promised them a spirit that would dwell within them mm. and guide them through this journey. Not that the Bible's unnecessary, mm -hmm. but to treat it like this unadulterated word of God allows it to be weaponized in ways it was never intended to be weaponized. Yep. And that's what's being used now by Western Christianity to hold people in oppression and in submission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's this notion of the tyranny of propositions, right? That that when we think that that um, we have words that are that contain truth, and that that there's um there's a, there's an imposition of a of a preformed structure onto the world um, through a specific set of of words, which trumps 
the a, a, a knowing that is um, perspectival and procedural and participatory in the world and 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 in truth as such it's it's i think it'd be interesting to talk to you more about that notion of of almost an entrapment of of what it means to follow christ within a a glorification of a specific way yeah. of accessing that through propositions and just look at it in the story of the canaanite woman right no christian reads that passage with an open mind mm. because if you did you would absolutely conclude christ was being ethnocentric but because you have a a preconceived notion or understanding that christ was perfect mm -hmm. so therefore whatever he was doing with the woman had to be loving mm -hmm. even though he was not just acting ethnocentrically he was literally telling her i didn't come for you mm -hmm. i came for the jews he said that to her mm. yeah yeah you know well there's one of the um there's an interesting note that i've i've, I've looked at and i've heard from some people where in in a lot of the scriptures the jews while while there's this you know it's written from the perspective of the jews it is often paints their their own ethnocentricity in a bad light by um painting the 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 others around them in positive lights like in the for example in the exodus story where um uh the in moses's story he's saved by the by the uh, by the egyptian princess and he is you know he he goes and he works with his his father-in-law who's a midianite a priest of another country or of another um, ethnicity um, and there, there's multiple places where there's this, there's this, like, like you get the ethnocentric thing, but you actually get the, the, the ones being ethnocentric as, as being straightforwardly, um, those in the wrong. Um, it's, it's anyway, I know we're at nearly out of time. Um, but <laughs> we, we could talk for, for quite some time. Yes. Th I mean, thank I, you for I, coming. I, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm glad we could have this discussion. I hope this is helpful for you and 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 for your listeners. Um, you know, I'm I'm trying to figure out a way to engage. And we got off. We got down more of the theological track than we did the track on race mm -hmm. and on things about that. But as a country and as a church. There are so many things we have to figure out how to talk about. Mm -hmm. And we have no clue how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and the book I've written and the videos I put out, there's another video I would highly recommend for your 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 listeners or your, your viewers. Um, it's a TEDx talk I gave. It's called We the People, the Three Most Misunderstood Words in U.S. History. Mm. It's a 17, 18 minute kind of synopsis of my teaching on the doctrine of discovery. Mm. Um, and it really kind of lays out in some very, in a very short span of time, uh, the deeply problematic um, history of the doctrine of discovery and what we've done with it as a, both a church as well as as a nation. Mm -hmm. um, but we need to learn how to talk about these things. And, and there, there's a quote that I often use to wrap up some of these conversations it was used by george erasmus who is uh from the Diné nation up in canada and when he was writing about the truth and reconciliation commission there he used this quote that says where common memory is lacking and where people do not share in the same past there can be no real community if you want to build community he said you have to start by creating common memory and that's this journey I'm on. That's the conversation. I'm not trying to shame people. I'm not trying to um, just flip the flip the things and get other people to experience what we've experienced. I'm trying to create a common memory so mm -hmm. that we can actually all work together to building a healthier community. And I think that's something we we need to we need to do a much better job of. So thank you for engaging for a while in the conversation here, and I look forward to future dialogues we might be able to have. Yes, absolutely. I think that's a a noble goal and one that I would love to participate in. And I I I, I feel as if 
you know, we we got to lay a lot of context in this conversation, and and maybe if uh, if we continue from here, we can continue to. I, I, I like to try to elucidate the very core um, nature of where some of these tensions lie and then maybe build back from there. So um, thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure.